Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 25 in our continuing study of the book of Proverbs. We've been in the, the section, the middle section, one verse maxims, uh, starting with chapter 10 all the way to chapter 29. We we're coming to that second major section. Uh, these are going to be the Proverbs collected by the men of Hezekiah, starting in chapter 25. Notice uh, we're going to have two sections there. Chapters 25 through 27 will be comparisons, and then chapter 28 through 29 will be contrasts. We begin with chapter 25 and verse 1. Here's our title uh, section. These also are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, just in case you think there's two different Hezekiahs, uh, the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, transcribed. So uh, Solomon died in 931 B.C. Remember, in the, when we're in the B.C. numbers, we're going the numbers are going backwards, they're going downhill. He died in 931 B.C. Uh, 244 years later, you have Hezekiah, who died in 687 B.C. Uh, so we're roughly about 200, 250 years later when these Proverbs, still described as the Proverbs of Solomon, but these Proverbs are being collected and put into this section. So the book of Proverbs isn't all written at the same time. It's not all collected at the same time. Uh, it's a composition that takes place over the years. We begin with the topic of kings in verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of, but the glory of kings to search out a matter. Uh, think about this. You know, God doesn't always reveal everything. Some some of the things of God are are concealed, and yet kings they seek to search out those things. You know, uh, to make decisions, uh, to um, reveal those uh, decisions. Verse three: As for the heavens, for uh, as the heavens for height, and the earth for depth, so is the heart of kings. So the heart of kings is unsearchable. Uh, you know, glory of kings, they may search out a matter, but that doesn't mean you always know what's, what they're thinking about. <laughs> uh, and, and that's the idea here. Verse 4, take away the dross from the silver, and there comes out a vessel for the smith. It's an interesting little proverb. Uh, so you've got the unsearchable things. Uh, take away the dross from the silver. Uh, and then verse 5 uh, is sort of Picking up verse 4 is, is saying something, and then verse 5 is saying something a little like that. Take away the wicked before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Uh, you know, kings can be, kings can be um, influenced sometimes, and so you don't want a bad influence around you if you're a king. Um, it's, but notice the sort of the king theme that ran through this. It continues, when, and here's the parable that he gives. When you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. He continues, and he who invited both, uh, he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. He continues, but when you are invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, and then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. And then he concludes, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, it could be that Jesus is actually referencing this proverb. It, 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 they stand uh, as echoes, almost like uh, in harmony with each other. A uh, warning, don't, don't claim honor in the, play, in the place of the king. It's better that you be lifted up uh, by the voice of another than that you try to lift up yourself and then, and then you, be, you be relegated to a lower spot. <clears throat> now we move from the king to the court, verse 8. Do not go out hastily to argue your case. Otherwise, what will you do in the end when your neighbor humiliates you? In other words, don't be uh, ready to take your case to court, to, uh, before the court could be before a king, could be before a judge. Don't hurriedly go out to that. You might lose your case. <laughs> Instead, verse 9, argue your case with your neighbor and do not reveal the secret of another. In other words, you know, keep, keep things quiet if they can remain quiet appropriately. Uh, verse 10, or he who hears it will reproach you, and the evil report about you will not pass away. So again, uh, you know, 
Uh, this is sort of an honor and shame thing, just like the previous section was. Uh, although instead of uh, being invited to the presence of the king, this is taking your case to the presence of either a king or a judge. Uh, and be careful how you how you take that, because and, and so the points being made uh, this is the value of setting settling a matter privately. Settle it privately because it might not actually come out in your favor, and you might be the one who is publicly embarrassed. Notice that's the the common theme, the common thread between these two verses and the previous verses. <clears throat> now, uh, the topic is going to be uh, words. Uh, like apples, and our translators have put in the word like, uh, and, and that's okay. Uh, it, it fits. Uh, they're helping us out. Uh, like apples of gold in, set, in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. You know, um, when you have just the right thing to say and you say it, that's, that just tastes good. <laughs> that, that's the point here. And then verse 12, like an earring of gold, and an ornament of fine gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Again, if you can set someone straight, not in a bad way, but in a good way, you can give good advice, um, that can be just the right thing to say. Those are good words. Verse 13, uh, another, another comparison. Like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him for he refreshes the soul of his masters. Again, having the right thing to say, maybe the right message, maybe the good news, and think about what this means to us today. Uh, we Christians are bearers of good news. We can be like um, the cold of snow in the time of harvest. We can be like that faithful messenger. We can refresh the souls of those who hear as we speak the good news of Jesus. Verse 14 like clouds and wind without rain, <clears throat> is a man who boasts of his gifts falsely. <laughs> now, here, <clears throat> here's somebody who, who says words, but they are not good. <laughs> he says, I'm able to do this, that, and the other. But really, it's a unfair boasting. He, he doesn't have that ability. <laughs> That's clouds, without, uh, clouds and wind without rain. In other words, things that promise good things. Remember, in a farm, you want, you want the wind and the rain to come. Uh, you're, you're boasting of something, but it, it just doesn't show up. Verse 15, by forbearance, a ruler may be persuaded, and a soft tongue breaks the bone. Uh, again, um, words, words matter. Uh, so notice they, they matter sometimes to rulers, but even a soft tongue, uh, a word prop properly spoken or improperly spoken can can, you know, a soft tongue can break the bone. Words can do damage. Uh, we saw earlier, they can, they can be faithful, they can do healing, but they can also hurt very, uh, very terribly. Verse 16, have you found honey? And now our, our theme is excess. Have you found honey? Eat only what you need that you do not have it in excess and vomit it. Um, now remember, honey was, was their sweetener. That was their their, their sweet thing, you know, um, I'm not sure that they had chocolate back then. That, um, and that, that's my weakness. Let me just uh, confess it right now. Uh, and yet there's a warning here. Uh, don't go to excess. Now here the illustration is given in the area of what you eat. So that's the principle stated. But now we're going to see the principle applied. Verse 17, let your foot rarely be in your neighbor's house, or he will become weary of you and hate you. That's the application. That's the principle applied. Um, uh, you know, excess in what you eat, but also excess in how you uh, visit or maybe take advantage of someone's hospitality. Um, don't overdo that. You know, you, you might not want to wear out your welcome. Verse 18, like a club and a sword... And a sharp arrow is a man who bears false witness against his neighbor. That's a bad thing. Let me just say, don't, don't be bearing false. Don't be saying things that aren't true. And sometimes um, you can do th those sorts of things purposefully. Or sometimes you can do it, I think more often it happens inadvertently, where somebody jumps to a conclusion 
and says something about somebody else that they, they really haven't checked out. So be careful of that. Verse, uh, so this is dealing, by the way, this is going to be dealing with conflicts. Um, the, the false witness, you know, sort of is the idea of a conflict. We're going to see this again in verse 19. Like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot. And I've had, I remember one time I had a, tooth, a, a molar crack, and it was just before a Bible study. That was just terrible. Um, is confidence in a faithless man in time of trouble. Uh, so, you know, you don't want to be trusting in somebody that's not going to follow through. You know, when, when times are good, it might not matter. But when times are bad, in a time of trouble, that can be a bad thing. Uh, let me just say, in my own experience, um, I did a whole career as a firefighter. And so uh, we were actually in a career where we were going in times of trouble. That was just That was just part of what we did. And you wanted to be able to depend fully on every member of your firefighting and rescue team. Let me just say, I had a great team that worked with me. Um, and, and, but one weak link can, can make it all go poorly. Verse 20, like one who takes off a garment on a cold day, uh, or like vinegar on soda, is he who sings songs to a troubled heart. Um, now, here the idea, you say, well, isn't, uh, isn't singing songs to a troubled heart a good thing? Well, um, I don't think that's the way it's being presented here. I notice one who takes off a garment on a cold day. On a cold day, you want to put the garment on. And singing songs might be a nice thing, but when the heart is troubled, sometimes you want to get away from the joy and the merriment because it just doesn't fit. Uh, it's like a blast of cold air when, it's all, when you're already cold and shivering. Uh, where you want to be away from such things. Still dealing with conflicts, verse 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he is thirsty, this is still speaking of your enemy, give him water to drink, for you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Now, uh, this passage is quoted in Romans chapter 12, verse 20, uh, the, the, entire, the entire proverb. Uh, as Paul in that passage is saying, uh, don't, you know, try to render evil for evil, render, render good for evil. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to drink. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. That part is pretty clear to understand. What is puzzling is verse 22, this reference, you will heap burning coals on his head. That sounds a bit like a figure of speech. Uh, and that's the question. Is it a figure of speech where you're going to be doing something bad for him? or good for him when you heap burning coals on his head. Uh, for example, is this a response of judgment? Psalm chapter 140, verse 10, um, gives this um, imprecatory, it's like an imprecatory prayer um, uh, about uh, the enemies of the psalmist, may burning coals fall upon them. May they be cast into the fire, into deep pits from which they cannot rise. Is that the sort of thing that's taking place here? Um, if you do good to him and he is doing evil to you, then then it's like it's like it's accelerating his judgment, uh, where um, by your kindness he more judgment is heaped upon him, and the, the Lord rewards you. Is that's what is that what is in view here, or is it a response of mercy, such as Job chapter forty two and verse six? Where Job is, uh, remember that's that whole Job section where he's been uh, confronted by God, and um, you know he he recognizes when once he meets God that God is big and he's not, and God is is pure and he's not, and then he says, therefore I retract and I repent in dust and ashes, sort of the the burning coals. Is this a burning coal of repentance that that my actions will bring uh, this person, my enemy, to repentance? So which is it? Is it judgment? Is it mercy? I can't help but wonder if, you know, is it judgment or is mercy? The answer depends on his response. That if he responds in repentance, then I have brought him to repentance, and that has been the thing that brought mercy to him. But if he responds continuing that evil heart against me, then the response, it brings judgment. That maybe it's not, does it bring one or does it bring the other? That really is up to him. 
Verse 23, still dealing with conflicts. The north wind brings forth rain and a backbiting tongue, an angry countenance. Uh, that's just sort of a proverb that speaks to itself. You know, uh, um, when people are saying things either to your face or behind your back, uh, that's that's not going to bring forth a good thing. Uh, verse 24, it is better to live in a corner of the roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Again, uh, dealing with conflicts. And we've seen that parable or that proverb before. Uh, this, that's not the first time we've come across that. Verse 25, like cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a distant land. Uh, again, re- that reminds me when I, whenever I hear about the good news, I think of that term gospel. That's the way you say good news in the New Testament. It's the same word. Um, and, and we are bringing, there's a sense in which we are bringing good news from a distant land we are that refreshing cold water to a weary soul. Verse 26, like a trampled spring and a polluted well. Notice water in, is in both of these. Um, uh, in the first, in verse 25, it was good. In verse 26, it's not. Like a trampled spring and a polluted well is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. And that's, that's not a good thing. Uh, you know, if you're righteous, then, then hold your righteousness. Don't be swayed by the wicked. Verse 27, it is not good to eat much honey. Now, we mentioned uh, honey in in the realm of access before. Here it is not good to eat much honey, nor is it glory to search out one's own glory. Now, here the idea is that, notice, it's not glory to search out one's own glory. Um, Don't go trying to puff yourself up. Don't blow your own horn. Um, you know, there are some people that history has, in, uh, has labeled, you know, the great, I think, and like Alexander the Great, or we even talk about Herod the Great, not because he was a nice guy, but because he, he built a lot of things. Um, but there was one person in history <laughs> that gave himself the title, <laughs> and that's Pompey the Great. He actually uh, went to the folks around him. He says, you don't mind if I start calling myself uh, Pompus, Pompey Maximus, uh, Pompey Pompey uh, the Great. <laughs> and I think everybody sort of snickered and, and said, go ahead, knock yourself out. Uh, and he did. Of course, he, his end it was not all that great. Remember, he uh, is beheaded uh, after he's lost to Julius Caesar. Um, so um, maybe you might want to let history put on those accolades and not try to do it yourself. It's not good to eat too much honey, excess, nor is it glory to search out one's own glory. Uh, verse 28, like a city that is broken into... And without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. Um, someone who lacks self-control, maybe even in the in the seeking out of their own glory. You see how these two can almost be a uh, a pair. You know, a man who has no control over his spirit that can be a bad thing. Uh, self-control, self-control in all things. 